A 21-year-old Californian man spends some time with a new female acquaintance for a few hours in the middle of the night, then leaves her, goes out to a place primarily known for hiking, seemingly drives his car on a fire road that is extremely dangerous at a high rate, damages his car in all kinds of ways, does a bit of Snapchatting, and then sends a few very bizarre text messages and disappears. Today, we're looking into the case of Matthew Weaver, and it's time that we turn on the searchlight. Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. This case really threw me for a loop. I'm literally filming this about three to four hours later than I typically do for a searchlight, but I bumped into a whole bunch of new information that has really given me uh, a different perspective on this, and I wanted to be sure to get all that and have a good understanding of that before I put this video out. There's a very simple version of the story that we have seen uh, in the media in terms of Matthew Weaver's disappearance, and there's a lot of details that are going to kind of chip away at that version of the story a little bit. Uh, even a press release put out by the police doesn't seem to contain accurate information. So let's go ahead and get started with this and see if we could try to clear things up as we go along. Um, basically, his an uncle of his named, uh, who's calling himself Joe Canejo on Web Sleuths, has been filling in a lot of the gaps in these stories, making a lot of clarifications to what he saw uh, was being discussed that he thought was not correct. So I'm gonna try to sprinkle in his information as we go through all of this. Here we have a picture of Matthew Weaver. We can see he is a male, white Caucasian. Date of last contact is August 10th, 2018. Uh, which, of course, we've got some serious cause for concern now that we're several months after that. Missing from Topanga, California is what they have listed. Um, and he was actually living in a section called Granada Hills. This is kind of around my old stomping grounds. I lived around this area for about a decade, so I'm pretty familiar with um, some of what we're going to be talking about here in terms of uh, the layout of the towns and the topography and even part of Malibu Canyon, not necessarily the part that he, that his car was found on, but, um, so missing at the age of 21, of course, he's still 21 years old and we can see five foot 10 and about 130 pounds. Um, they have their map. Their map is actually not really showing where his car was found, but we'll take a look at a map that I've pulled up in a minute here. Matthew's car was found abandoned near Rosa's Overlook on the Topanga Lookout Trail he was last seen on August 10th, 2018. Just bare bones in terms of the circumstances. Uh, and that's honestly part of the challenge with this is the police that are handling this case are not doing a lot of media engagement. Um, I, I can see just a few comments from them here or there where they were asked very specific questions, but they're not really engaging media in terms of sharing information that might actually shake some tips loose. Uh, it seems like his family is opting to share information with media directly in an effort to do that. So we're going to cover a couple of sources, including, of course, uh, his uncle's information from Web Sleuths as we're going through here. Brown hair. Uh, here they have it listed as hazel eyes, but uh, in several other places, I'm also seeing brown in terms of his eye color. Uh, when I look at some of the photos, I, I can see why people would consider them uh, more hazel. Um, for other distinctive physical characteristic, they're saying facial hair, partial beard, and mustache, kind of like we can see in this photo here. Um, but they're missing some other critical information. Apparently, he does have a tattoo on his chest that says Jeremiah. Um, that is a tattoo that he did in honor of an uncle of his that passed away. Um, I haven't heard of any other tattoos on him outside of that, but at least we know that there's one tattoo there. For the clothing, he was wearing an Angels baseball cap, red shoes, and Dickies pants. Um, they don't have the car information listed in here. Of course, we know that the car has been found. And here we have a bigger version of the picture. I know on that new Namus dashboard, that little picture is just a little bit too little for the screen share here. So here is the same photo blown up. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the map now. Here we are looking at what is known as Rosa's Overlook. And um, we can see down here this kind of cross section between uh, Shuren or Shuren Road, Saddle Peak Road, 
and Stunt Road, kind of where all these meet. This is apparently where um, he posted to uh, Snapchat a, a picture from down here. And we're going to go through a time frame and a later article on all this. But his vehicle is found, and you can see even on the map here, they have a little bit of what they consider a road, but then it kind of cuts to uh, typically, I believe this is the marker for trails. And all the way up near Rose's Overlook, just shy of it, is where his vehicle is found. Now, what's weird about this is there is also a gate here, and somehow that gate was opened, obviously, if his vehicle went past that. So um, a, a lot of concern about what's going on out here. The time of the night that he was out here just doesn't make sense to me. If you look at pictures of Rosa's Overlook, you can see a lot of people go up there. It is just completely covered in graffiti. Um, some locals are saying they think that there's a lot of partying that goes on out in this area. And we have some information that might actually support that maybe that's what he was planning on doing. But let's go ahead and get through uh, some more info here. Here is a picture of his car. And um, I know a lot of people look at this and are immediately concerned about what they consider to be spray paint on it. Apparently, this is done by the search and rescue team. And of course, I want to thank uh, his uncle, Joe Conejo, for sharing that with the Web Sleuths community um, so that the search and rescue team knows that this location has already been gone through. But we can also see there's other problems here. His front bumper is completely missing. Uh, we can see his trunk is completely open, and according to some reports, we're going to see something might be wrong with the lock back there as well. Um, and his uncle did say that it seems like he went over this road at a, a, a pretty fast pace for the type of damage that they saw that happened to his vehicle. So what was going on? I really have no idea. Let's start with the LAPD news release on this. The family of Matthew Jonathan Weaver Jr. and the Los Angeles Police Department's Missing Persons Unit are asking for the public's help in locating him. It is believed Matthew was last seen on August 10th, 2018 at 9.30 p.m. in the 2600 block of Stern Street in the city of Simi Valley. His vehicle was located on August 11th, 2018. Now, I don't know why, but apparently this information about the last time he was cited uh, is not correct. And um, if you look up that actual address, it turns out to be an In-N-Out Burger that is in Simi Valley. Um, but even this is not necessarily saying it's that specific address. It's just saying that he was seen on that block. According to information that came out from his family, um, they're saying they don't know where this supposed sighting came up. And it's not really the last known sighting of him. Um, so it's, I, I don't know, guys, it, it's weird that we have so much bad information going right off into this case, but unfortunately that's what we have over at dailynews.com. August 31st, 2018 is when this was published. The search continued Monday for a 21 year old man missing 17 days whose vehicle was found abandoned near Topanga. His vehicle was located the following day on the Topanga Tower Motorway near Rosa's Overlook, above the Backbone Trail and Hondo Canyon areas. He had recently moved to the Granada Hills area and is a longtime Simi Valley resident. Uh, and just let me be clear that Granada Hills and where his car are located, not exactly next to each other. So definitely something drew him back out to that location. I don't know if he was meeting up with someone. Um, I'm, I am seeing some information. I can't confirm this. This is really being more discussed on web sleuths that the um, female that he met up with in the middle of the night, that they might have gone out to that same, around that same area. Uh, and then he took her home and then he might've gone back to that location. I, I can't find a good source on that. I don't know if that's really true. But what we do know is he did spend a few hours with this uh, female, and then later he basically winds up out at this location. So pretty clear to me that, that something pulled him out there. And he spent a bit of time when he was out there, too. We're going to see when we go through some of the time frames here. I mean, we're, we're talking hours that he's out at this location. Uh, it seems like his car might have been there for as long as four hours while he was at least still there because uh, they track the GPS. They can see that it's where the car was and he sends text messages about four hours after that. So uh, just a lot of questions. I really don't know what's going on with this one. Over at simivalleyacorn.com, we can see article young man vanishes. Um, I also wanted to point out his hat here. 
This hat is matching the description of the one that he was last seen wearing. I don't know if it's exactly the same hat, but I do believe that they talked about it being a uh, angel's hat. Let me just double check that over back at NamUs. Um, just want to make sure I'm not giving you guys bad info because sometimes when I'm going through this, yeah, angel's baseball cap. So this might be the same cap. Of course, they have all kinds of different variations on Angels baseball caps. Um, but here we have a picture of him wearing that one specifically. Matthew Weaver Sr., his father, said his world was upended in the early morning hours of August 11th when authorities notified him that the car belonging to his son, Matthew Weaver Jr., had been found abandoned in the Topanga Canyon area of the Santa Monica Mountains. Quote, since Matt vanished, life has been a living hell, especially knowing it's not like him to just up and leave without telling anyone. I saw him two days before he went missing, and he was his normal happy self. I never thought that it might be the last time I would hug my son. Um, and Matthew, I certainly hope that isn't true. I really hope that there's some other outcome to this story that... Um, we just can't see with the information that we have right now. The younger weaver, a native of Simi who recently moved to Granada Hills, also has a passion for rescuing animals and is extremely close with his brother, 17, and his sisters, ages 14 and 24. Malibu Search and Rescue has conducted several searches for Matthew Jr. since he was reported missing. Air support and dogs have been used, but nothing has turned up. Uh, I heard they also used infrared when they were out there early on in the searching, um, but unfortunately, obviously, they did not find him. Over at KTLA.com, his sister, Colleen Weaver Farrell, told KTLA he just moved to Granada Hills from Simi Valley three or four months ago. She said her brother posted a Snapchat of a valley at the trail the day he went missing. Hikers said they alerted authorities in the early morning hours of August 11th after seeing his vehicle, which was discovered abandoned shortly after he went missing. According to his sister, one of the back tires was found hanging off a cliff. Um, now, of course, this makes me think right away of a possible accidental scenario. Uh, if there is that type of cliff on one or both sides of the road. Uh, and I can tell you guys, I used to have a commute through that area and there are some very extreme cliffs. There are uh, a lot of very, th there, there's a lot of very thick brush out there, a lot of trees and foliage. It basically is a channel between, um, kind of on the other side of the hills, you have the San Fernando Valley, and then you have Malibu and the beaches and everything. So there's a lot of moisture that happens because of all the water out there. And because of that, despite the fact that they have really, really high temperatures, um, the foliage grows very rapidly, of course. And then there's also, you know, a lot of fire potential out there as well. But um, so it's really, really thick brush. His uncle also commented on that. It's very, very hard for them to search through it as well. So I was thinking of the possibility, you know, did his car get stuck? He got out, tried to walk down some type of accidental situation. His family certainly believed that in the early days, but according to info I'm seeing from them now, uh, that has kind of gone by the wayside, especially after they've had so many searches out there, professional searching for him, as well as personal searches. Um, everyone is fairly confident that he would have been found if this was a simple accidental situation. So seems like we have something else at play here, uh, of course. And then that thing about the uh, his trunk um, being open is really nagging at me a, a, as well. I just, it feels to me like there's a possibility of a foul play scenario going on here. Uh, we've looked into cases that have taken place kind of near where this is. Uh, the Matrice Richardson case, it was a brain scratch we did a while ago. Uh, she went missing a few miles from where this is. There's a lot of current talk about shootings that have been happening in this area. Uh, some celebrities have even been commenting on it publicly. Uh, we're going to touch on some of that information as well. But honestly, the, the worst of those shootings, which was a man who was camping with his two daughters, happened at Malibu State Park. And that is about close to probably 10 miles away from where this vehicle is. So are these things really related? Uh, I'm not certainly, I'm not sure. And of course, we don't know enough about what's going on with this case to know if it's indeed a foul play situation. Um, but the fact that 
I can I kind of feel comfortable ruling out the accidental situation because of how much searching they've been doing there. What else are we looking at? It really feels like it's going that way, but uh, let's continue with the article here. His father, Matthew Weaver Sr., said he suspected foul play. Weaver Farrell told KTLA the 21-year-old worked with their dad and that she didn't think he was familiar with hiking in the area. Uh, his uncle does comment on this at Web Sleuths as well. First of all, his uncle says that uh, he actually doesn't work with his dad, but a friend of their dad's. I don't know if the dad also works for that friend. So I'm kind of confused because I'm seeing somewhat conflicting information on that. Um, but his uncle said the same thing, that he wasn't he wasn't known to be a hiker, but he apparently was known to go to this area. And that's about as much detail as we get from his uncle there. So I don't know if this was a regular place where he would go to meet up with other people. Um, like I mentioned before, it seems like that some young people might get together out there and, and party. So... Uh, is that why he was known to go out there regularly? Possibly. Uh, in terms of just kind of the scenery of that area in California, like if you want to go for a cruise or something like that, if you want to go clear your mind, I don't really see you driving around there in particular. Maybe you would drive on Mulholland, but honestly, it's not it's not the funnest drive to do. It's really windy. Uh, if you want to just kind of relax, it's really going down to, to Pacific Coast Highway and just heading for the water and you got beautiful beaches on one side of you. Uh, you can head towards Santa Monica. You could head away from Santa Monica if you want to kind of get out of the city a bit. Um, it just, it doesn't seem like that's the type of location you're going to go because, oh, I just want to clear my head. Uh, admittedly, there is an outlook there that is pretty scenic outside of all the graffiti that's on the actual concrete. Uh, concrete, It does have a nice view of the ocean from where it is and a nice view of that part of the canyon. Um, but if he's not known to really be a hiker, is that really something he's going to do as well? I don't know. So many questions with this one. Uh, quote, we have no leads, nothing, said his sister. A prior tip that Weaver had been spotted at an in and out in Simi Valley on August 10th turned out to be incorrect, according to the family. Authorities provided no further information about the case. Uh, the local Malibu.com, this is the local publication I'm talking about. Uh, let me just say, first of all, that it's pretty obvious to me that this is not a, uh, a major mainstream news source. Uh, this feels kind of like small town. Uh, sometimes you'll have someone that's writing all the articles for their their local paper or something like that. That's more of what this feels like. Web Sleuths community, very critical of the woman that's putting together the information here. Um, and it does, even for me, there's certain aspects of it where I'm not sure that you need to mention like Matrice Richardson and Elaine Park and try to lump them together with this particular instance and all the shootings. Um, I just, I don't know how much value there is in all that because we don't know that this is a shooting to begin with. Um, you know, the Matrice Richardson and Elaine Park things, at least, especially the Elaine Park thing, uh, I've actually looked into that case. I haven't covered it on the channel, but I kind of kept tabs on it. If I remember right, I believe there's some aspect of that case that touches, uh, Stunt Street, which is one of those three streets that I was pointing out earlier or a stunt road right here. Uh, if I remember right, there's something tickling in my brain about the possibility that she might have been sighted at a home off of here or something along those lines. I, I Honestly, I could be confusing that with the Matrice case as well. So some possibility that there's something to do with stunt road is just kind of nagging at the back of my mind in terms of relation. But outside of that, um, I, I just, I don't know that there's enough to say that these things are related. But let's go ahead and read some of the local Malibu. New details have come to light. This is also the area that has been plagued by reports of shots fired and other mysterious crimes. Since the death of Tristan Boudet on June 22nd, Malibu Canyon has seen a total of at least seven confirmed shooting incidents. Um, once again, I just, I don't know that this is a shooting incident. 
Shortly after midnight on August 11th, a witness called 911 after hearing a cry for help screams near Stunt and Shuren Road, where Matthew Jr.'s gray BMW was found. First responders arrived shortly after at approximately 2 a.m., and at least two of them, a member of the CHP and of the fire department, also heard screams slash cry for help. Now, I don't know where that information is coming from. I can't find any mainstream media sources that are reporting that same thing. So we have to take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. Uh, also, there's a very simple timeline that, that she's talking about here that uh, this was called in shortly after midnight and the first responders didn't actually show up until 2 a.m. I've seen other information that says, no, this was actually called in uh, somewhere between 12 and 1 and first responders showed up, I think between 1.30 and 2 or something like that. So I know you look at something like this and you're like, wow, a two hour gap just to get emergency services out there when you have you know, people screaming in the middle of the night like someone's being harmed or something like that. Um, I don't think the time frame is necessarily that bad. I think it's quite a bit shorter. Still, 30 minutes to an hour, you might still think, hey, you know, can't we get some better services out there? But admittedly, there's a lot of terrain out there. I don't know. Um, if I remember right, the local sheriff station is probably... 12 miles away from this. And I don't think they have another station that's closer. They might. I'm not 100% sure on that. But uh, typically Lost Hill Sheriff Station, who I believe is working this case also, um, would be servicing that area. So uh, 12 miles. Could you, This isn't the type of area where you could really go 60 miles per hour. But you could still expect that you should probably have someone popping up out there within about 30 minutes, I think would, would be fair. Lost Hills Sheriff Department and Search and Rescue responded to the scene with multiple air and canine support as well as infrared technology. According to Matthew Sr., canines did pick up a scent but lost it before they reached the road. Now, his uncle described this on Web Sleuths as well. Basically, they picked up a scent from his car, which seemed like he was starting back down in the opposite direction of where his car was stuck and it went about 100 yards from where his car was, and then the dogs lost it. And you're talking about a stretch of road that looks like it's between a mile and a half to two miles, or not even road, but a stretch of path that is a mile and a half to two miles. So they only got about 100 yards back by the time they, they lost the scent. Um, it does make you wonder, is there a potential for another vehicle to have picked him up or taken him away from there? Um, however, there is a camera that caught his vehicle entering this and that camera did not catch any other vehicles entering this area as well. So I think we can kind of rule out a second vehicle in this case. I'm not 100% sure on the placement of that camera, but his uncle seems fairly confident that they could rule that out. Uh, also one difference, I know um, before I mentioned his sister said that one of the rear wheel tires seemed to be off the road. His uncle said it was the front right tire that was actually off the road. So just to make, I don't know if it's a clarification or not. Uh, unfortunately, you can't really see it in the photos, but uh, let's continue with the article here. If no foul play was involved, one would imagine a body would have been located after three, possibly four searches, yet law enforcement has found no sign of Weaver. I certainly agree with that. Uh, and then they're mentioning the Matrice Richardson and Elaine Park cases as well. The family is frustrated with the backlog at LAPD, Sergeant Wright from Lost Hills Sheriff's Department has been working closely with LAPD and assures they are doing their due diligence and reviewing evidence along with interviewing family and acquaintances. And let me just say his uncle kind of spoke up. Um, actually, I don't think it's his uncle. I think I'm getting that confused now. Uh, in another article, we're going to see that there is a comment the family makes that um, they're not saying that they're frustrated with LAPD at all. Uh, I believe it's actually an article where his brother is speaking. So, um, like I said, unfortunately, we don't have a good source with this type of statement in here. So I can't really tell you where that's coming from. Uh, let's go ahead and continue with another article also from the local Malibu. And this one has a bit of a time frame. And someone at Web Sleuths, I think it might be Raz, hope I'm remembering that correctly, has been putting together a timeline as well. Uh, and it pretty much lines up with this one. This one is a little less granular, but I think it really hits on the main stuff that we need to discuss. So uh, let's check this out. 
August 10th, Matthew drops off a female friend at 5 a.m. And actually, let's roll it back just a little more than this. Uh, on Thursday, he gets paid. And from what I understand, he doesn't actually get a paycheck. He gets paid cash directly, probably has something to the tune of about $500 on him. Meets up with this friend uh, around 2 a.m. And they're together till sometime between 4.30 a.m. and 5 a.m. Uh, then after he drops her off, he heads towards Stunt and Shuren Road. The gate suspiciously left open when it normally remains locked. Uh, and then it goes to describe that um, they're only the only people that should have access to that gate are first responders and law enforcement officials. However, I did hear that there is an old microwave tower that is up there. I don't know if that's beyond the gate, but apparently there's some construction happening around that area. So it seems like the gates are being left open for construction vehicles to come in and go out. Uh, and the article is also going to say that despite the fact that the keys say do not duplicate, um, she's learned that people have been having copies made of the key. And here you can see the actual locking gate mechanism. Pretty, pretty hefty. Uh, GPS signal on Matthew Weaver Jr. cell phone tracks him at the Topanga Trail at 7.15 a.m. Later, Matthew Jr. cell phone tracks his last Snapchat post at 7.38 a.m. And his last text message to a female, the same female he dropped off at 5, indicating crazy crap is going on. And they actually have a snapshot here, thankfully, of the exchange. Uh, we can see when they're meeting up the night before. So uh, she's asking almost here at about 2.02 a.m. And then on August 10th, uh, he tried calling her and she couldn't respond. So she replied through messaging, I'm at work, what's up? And that was at 11.49 a.m. So he tried calling her at some point, uh, probably around 11.30 to 11.40, something like that. He says, like some crazy is going on, crap going on. Uh, I just, to talk while I have the chance. So obviously he's trying to say, I just want to talk while I have the chance. And this is at 11.53 a.m. Uh, she says, are you okay? Hey, are you okay? And that's the last that uh, she hears from him. That's the last contact that we have from him at all. But if we're talking about this time frame here, you know, him dropping her off at five in the morning, him driving out here, we've got traces of him around 7 a.m. Then we have him calling her and texting with her way after that. We're talking, you know, four hours or more after that. Uh, so what is going on in this time frame? I have no idea, but according to the information from his uncle, it seems like his vehicle is pretty much static through this, that there is no, no movement that he seems to just, I don't know if he's just sitting in his car. I don't know if he's just, uh, you know, taking in the morning view from there. I'm, I'm really not certain. Uh, I do think it's important to tell you guys that according to his uncle as the source on Web Sleuths, uh, you know, people were asking about the possibility of there being some type of drug use. His uncle says that the girl he was with did confirm that they were using narcotics. We don't know what kind. I would think it's probably something a little worse than marijuana. I believe marijuana is actually legal in California now. Um, so I think it could be something worse than that. If you look at some of the graffiti that's up at that particular area, uh, on one side of this one concrete wall in particular, literally in giant letters is the word meth. Uh, people on Web Sleuths have been asking him, trying to get more details about it. Is it possibly LSD? Might that explain you know, that he was on a bad trip of some kind when he decided to drive his car on that really rough road and basically you know, wreck his car pretty well? Uh, his uncle said that there was parts of his car basically on that trail uh, all the way, I mean, his bumper, but other parts of the car as well that had come off during that ride up that trail. Uh, so it sounds like, I don't know, sounds like uh, there was a lot of damage going on. It makes me wonder if he was actually driving the car or not. I, I almost have this situation in my mind where, you know, someone takes him at gunpoint, puts him in the back seat or puts him in the trunk and then drives his car up there to leave him up there, something along those lines. But um, I don't know. 
It certainly feels like foul play. That's all I can say. It just it keeps coming back to that for me. The car was located two miles down the dirt trail off Stunt Road at Shuren Road. Uh, a female and male voice were heard screaming for help by witnesses, specifically saying somebody has a gun. Uh, once again, please take this with a grain of salt. We're, we're not given good sources here, and I can't point to mainstream media and say, yep, that information is verified. Uh, his uncle has not verified any specific statements that were made uh, about what these people were screaming. At approximately 1.30 a.m., first responders walk out to the side of Matthew Jr.'s car. Helicopters and a canine are dispatched. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting to me are the, the hikers that found his car um, were out there at midnight. Just, I don't know, a lot of strange activity going on in this area. I'm really wondering what's happening with that. Search and rescue has conducted at least five or more searches to date, and the Weaver family has conducted at least 15 or more searches with their family and friends. Uh, Matthew Weaver Jr.'s cell phone, wallet, car keys, and clothing have not been found. And then there's a strange note here. The trunk lock on Matthew's car was damaged from the inside. Now, of course, when I first saw that, thinking of a foul play situation, uh, that really rang bells for me. I'm thankful that I was able to find the information that his uncle's talking about on web sleuths. He tries to clear that up. He basically says the conclusion that they have come to is not that the trunk lock was damaged from the inside, but that it was damaged either from the drive in or the towing out. He said it took three tow trucks to actually get that car out from where it was stuck. Um, so he's pretty convinced that the damage happened in a different way. Of course, we don't have police sources that are talking about this to clarify any of this for us. So it's, it's really tough on that front. So what is his family thinking? This is a comment from his stepmother who lives in Simi Valley. There is no way that kid just fell off the grid and disappeared, Brooks said. For me, that's not possible. I'm super close with Matthew. He tells me everything. He calls me anytime he's in a bind. He would never let his little sibling sit here and think he might be dead. Now, almost two months after Matthew disappeared, Brooke fears the worst for her stepson. Quote, after the third day, I cried to my mom and said he's dead. I hate to sound hopeless, but if there's a chance that he's alive somewhere, then he's being held against his will. Interestingly, we get a little bit of a different perspective over at RadioMalibu.net from his brother. His brother, James Weaver, says that it's not even certain that Matthew Weaver is in the area. Quote, you know, Matthew was down for the last couple of months. Um, I didn't mention it before, but yeah, he had a longer term girlfriend that he had broken up with a few months before this. So I believe that might be part of what his brother James is referring to. I don't know if there's anything else outside of this. Um, let's let James continue because he, he gives a, a little more perspective on this. Mentally, you know, he was just, you know, maybe he was working and not being as successful as he wanted to be. I'm hoping maybe he just took a break. He spoke of New York candidly, so maybe, I'm hoping, he just took off and left the area. That's what I'm hoping for. And I think it's no surprise that he's using the word hope so much in that statement. Um, I really hope that this case has an outcome like that as well. Uh, let's continue here. Just let us know that you're alive. If you're doing something else with your life right now, that's fine. Uh, one thing the family wanted to pass on to the Malibu community, they have nothing but praise and thanks for the local sheriff's deputies and the county search and rescue efforts. They disavow claims circulated in Malibu that there's some sort of cover up regarding Weaver's disappearance. They say they have received excellent cooperation from the local sheriff's office. So a little bit of a different statement compared to what we heard at that other source before. Uh, of course, there is a web sleuth thread I'll have in the description box um, in the sources down below. But uh, I did want to point out in particular, if you want to find the comments posted specifically by his uncle, I'm going to have a separate link 
uh, down below. So you'll see only the comments posted by him. You can click on each one. What I do is I just open them in a new window and then read them one at a time. Um, it was a really good way to kind of get to a solid source and to take in all his information about what's going on in this area. Uh, I do have to put out just one caveat. He's not been verified by web sleuths yet. Um, I sincerely doubt this is someone that's going to be pranking web sleuths or something silly like that. Uh, he's given a lot of information and you can tell uh, his heart's really in the right place in terms of him trying to understand what could be going on here. He's very appreciative of all the help that uh, everyone at web sleuths is trying to give him as well. There is a Facebook page. I'll have a link to that in the description box below. And there is also a GoFundMe that is being run. Uh, you can see this is where I got the picture of the car from. They've been doing a very good job of doing regular updates on it. We can see they're trying to raise $5,000. I believe they have hired a private investigator. Um, they are at 3,600. And of course, on behalf of myself and my amazing Patreon and PayPal supporters, we are going to increase this amount just as soon as I'm done filming this today. So, brain scratchers, what do you think is going on with this case? Um, I don't know. This is a real tough one. There's a lot to make me think that this is a foul play scenario. Uh, we know that some form of drugs might be involved here. Is it possible that he went out with this girl, partied, maybe they burned through whatever supply they had, and that he wanted to go and find more? Uh, or he wanted to go back to a location where this party might have been going on. Um, it certainly feels like there might be some aspect to that. But then what happens from there? How does that car wind up on that path? And I mean, the car, not that it's obliterated, but there's a lot of damage that happened to that car on that last ride up there. And then he sits in the car just for hours um, there is an aspect to that that makes me wonder about the possibility the possibility that he could have been depressed or something along those lines. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's really, really strange. And I'm just, the fact that they haven't been able to find him, of, of course, is the most shocking thing. It, it really suggests the possibility that he might have been removed from the area in some way. Um, and I know you guys are probably wondering, well, if there was a camera that caught his car going up, didn't the camera catch anything coming out? According to information from his uncle, uh, the camera seems to be motion activated and he's not sure that people on foot would have been able to activate uh, the camera. I, that's something I would hope that investigators would actually look at and maybe try to test uh, to see if someone just walking down the path would actually trigger that camera to kick back on. It would be very good to know that because uh, if it does, in particular, if you got someone at night wearing approximately the same colors that he was and it still triggers it, uh, then I think they really need to redouble and refocus those search efforts um, on around where his car was. Uh, of course, then there's also the possibility that despite the fact that he's not into hiking, that he did go for some walk from there. I mean, it, it could be quite a bit of ways that that he actually got from that location. But then we also have to consider that message um, to the, the girl that he was hanging out with that night. What What's that message about? That he wants to talk to her while he can. What does that mean? And uh, a web sleuther brought up a really good point. We know his phone was working. He tried calling her. He sent several messages. So if he was really in some type of dire situation, wouldn't you have called the police? And for that, my mind kind of wonders, why wouldn't you call the police? And we do know that there might be, well, we know there's some type of drug use that's going on here. So maybe he had a reason for not necessarily wanting to call the police. Um, I don't know. I don't know. There's so much strange about this case. That's why I'm doing this, presenting it to you guys and looking forward to your thoughts on this. I really just, uh, I don't know where to go with this case from here. All right, so let's talk some comments from last week's episode. That was the Royal Francis, also known as Robert McLaughlin episode. Uh, we've got some information from a source on that. Let's go ahead and start with that. Um, this is someone that tweeted me and is someone that knows Robert very well. He was my best friend and roommate. I was the last person that seen him. He left my apartment 
while I was at work. The detective searched the area around my place extensively, looking for that key to the door. On his left arm tattoo, he had words. First, he got a cross, and on the right side, he got a Rasta man in lion face. It's old and redone two times. So thankfully, she's given us uh, some information on those um, those tattoos as well. Uh, he also has two iron plates in his right arm and elbow. His accident caused him to be in pain almost every minute, mostly in his shoulders. The detectives are unable to check his phone records because they need a subpoena and there is no indication that it's violence or criminal disappearance. Um, you know, I, that's really kind of strange to me. I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to recall, but I think in some cases of missing persons that they don't always have uh, a direct indicator of a any actual violence and they're able to get those records. You know what? I bet it's one of those things where it just varies from state to state, county to county, possibly even city to city. But uh, really tough that they're not able to get those phone records because that could be really, really helpful. Uh, if that is a regular thing, I think that there should be some mechanism where maybe people can opt in for uh, volunteering their phone records if they ever go missing or something along those lines. It's just it's such a useful tool. Uh, as a matter of fact, for the case we just covered, uh, I'm pretty sure they're looking at the phone records because if he was going out there to score, if he was going out there to rejoin the party, there's got to be some communication, some logistics for uh, that and for setting it up in the first place. So I'd even look at his phone records and roll that back a bit, you know, maybe a, a couple of weeks to a month or so and see if you can kind of get some sense about uh, who was going to be at that place. But yeah, really, really tough that they can't get the phone records in, in this case. Uh, Francis didn't do drugs and was not involved with bad people. He was like a brother for me. So just some clarifications. I'm happy we got a little information on the tattoos. Now let's get to some of your comments about Robert McLaughlin. Anthony says, we have a thing in Ireland in the UK called a liaison officer that goes between the police and the family for the exact reason you talk about, John. And it really works. It stops the breakdown between family and police. Uh, thanks, Anthony, for letting me know about that. That is something that would certainly help in a case like this. Um, I know his mother is doing everything she can to raise exposure to this. I did also hear um, from Robert's roommate that uh, his mother was very appreciative of the coverage and that she does intend to reach out to me. It hasn't happened yet, but um, supposedly that is going to happen in the future. So we might be able to get some more detail and raise some more exposure for her as well. Um, there was an interesting conversation that happened under Anthony's comments. Some people were supportive of the liaison officers. Some people had stories about, well, we had one and it didn't work out great. Um, it'd be nice just to have some mechanism for that, just someone with that responsibility, even if you might have individual instances where you know, they weren't a person that was very good at their job because uh, here for the cases that we're covering, obviously we don't have any mechanism for that. These people are dealing directly with the detectives. And quite honestly, if someone that I love went missing, I'd want the detectives working on that case, you know, not, not being on the phone with me all the time or being on the phone with other people all the time. The, to this component just seems really, really important to me. And I hope at some time this country figures that out and puts that into play here. Madison M. I live in Jacksonville, Florida, and I haven't heard about this case. This is very upsetting. Madison, I wish I was surprised by that comment, but um, it's pretty obvious. I did have some people that commented that were talking about, hey, you know, I saw it. It was, it was on local television. Having coverage of the bare bones of a case is not necessarily the hard part. Um, pretty much if you can get the police department to put out a press release, you're going to find several areas that cover that press release and the details in that press release. What you really need in a case like this is for some local reporter to take up the mantle, to really dig in and to find the pertinent details and to share those. And those details hopefully can elicit tips by shaking people's memories. Oh, I know this person. Oh, I was at that spot at that time. Um, and that's the tough thing. So, you know, getting the five minute blip, not even five minute, getting the 90 second blurb on a news channel 
isn't exactly what a, a case like this needs. It really needs someone to dig in a bit beyond that um, to get those those finer details that make this case unique. Because right now, this case, we don't know what happened with Robert. Seems like he just went out for a walk and just disappeared. I mean, that's that's not enough for any um, concerned citizen to be able to really help with this case, even if you lived in the area. And to Madison's point, you know, she lives in Jacksonville and she didn't even hear about it. So that local short television coverage or mention on the radio uh, or with the local publications, if they're just reciting what the police are saying, is it helpful? Sure. It's, it, there's a degree of helpfulness to it. Is it what these cases really, really need? There's a good chance that Madison might have heard a blurb or might have seen it and just doesn't recall it because there's there's no details that really stuck in her mind for her because uh, you know those press reports can be written pretty generically. They're, they're not the most interesting thing in the world. Uh, Shelly Belly, hope I'm saying that right. Uh, I really wish we didn't have to look for something to make someone's case look attractive to MSM. Everyone is important. Thanks, John, for being this family's voice. Love as always. Uh, yeah, I wish it wasn't the case, but it is. And even to the point I was just making about um, with Madison's comment, if there isn't something about the story that is hooking in the mind of the people that are hearing it, even if they're exposed to that story, the details are just going to flutter away and they're going to forget about it. Uh, that's part of the reason why in these episodes, I really try to incorporate as much of the humanity of the person as possible because there's something about when you hear that that missing person has the same favorite baseball team that you do or something along those lines, there's a little bit of a connection that happens there. Or you hear that that person struggled with their father or their mother or considered running away. There's something about that that a lot, a lot of us can connect to and it takes those aspects of the story to really stick with the public, at least in my opinion. And uh, mainstream media, when they when they do that right, it's obvious. You see it with those mega cases that get covered by everyone. And all of a sudden, there's all these investigative reporters and there's all these new details. And you're, you're hearing from people that you're not even sure are really related to the case because they're just looking to keep that case spun up on the news cycle because they know that it's clickable. Um, so it's weird because they have the model for making it work. And it, it is terrible that a case like Robert's doesn't necessarily fit that model. It, 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 really, it really is terrible. I, I, wish that we could, I wish we could change that also. And I, I don't know how outside of trying to be the change that I want to see and, and featuring those cases here. Ms. Kruger. I have sons. I pray, Angela, that you get answers soon. Everyone is important. Even if he was a thug, he deserves to be found. He has a mom that loves him. Bless Robert and his family. What about his brain injury? If he hit his head again, could it have caused amnesia? Stranger things have happened. Uh, Ms. Kruger, you touched on a very interesting point. Uh, also, there was a pretty lengthy comment by the Sasselberger, so I didn't want to include it, but brought up some of those considerations as well. When you're talking about someone that has a brain injury that substantial, there might be other things that happen uh, that might play into a scenario like this. Yeah, something along the lines of amnesia or just an altered reality. And the Sasselberger's message kind of really got into that um, pretty well, just in terms of uh, an experience that she had gone through and how she felt like, you know, like the world was wrong, or I, I can't remember how she worded it, like it was in a different dimension, I think is what she said. Uh, could it be that that's what we're dealing with here? Possibly. Could there also be emotional ramifications from a brain injury like that? I think we have to consider that possibility as well. Could he have been upset about his life all of a sudden and just couldn't handle the feelings, um, you know, decided to up and move across the country or something along those lines? I don't know. I don't know. I, I definitely think that we have to look at those possibilities when we're talking about a case like this. But we also have to rule out the basics. Um, what was going on in terms of him meeting up with his basketball group? I know several of you were asking about that. I still don't have any better detail on it. Um, you know, people that he was associating with, was there anyone that would have wanted to harm him for any reason? Just there's the basics in a case like this. And unfortunately, we don't have a bunch of detail because we don't have real investigative reporting going on here. We have 
press release recycling that's going on here. So it's, it's really, really tough to crack into. All right, everyone, that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do. I really can't do it without you guys. And all these comments, all the upvotes, all the views, everything tells me how much you guys care about people like Robert McLaughlin, about um, people like Matt Weaver. It's just, uh, it's really touching to me that we have this community. Thank you so much for being a part of that. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you back here on Friday with a new Brain Scratch. <laughs>